Okay, so this is the validation session of the OpenShiva Map Ireland's week-long mapathon. And we have here lecturer Sean Day in UCC, who is a master at validating our tiles and our um our uh, anything we happen to do wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so um as someone who has not yet been validating anything, because I, it kind of seems like that, what do I need to know that I can look at a tile and be sure that I've spotted everything? I mean, I know there's guidelines, but still, like, is there kind of, kind of things you have to kind of know beyond the basics to be a good validator? Hmm. I mean, obviously, it's going to come down to experience, and, and you may well be, you know, the only one here that hasn't really gotten into the validation game, and I do suspect that everybody approaches it from a very different angle. Um, and it is going to come down to your experience, but I think it also comes down to your perception of how things are going to be used. And that probably really clouds the way in which you look at the maps when you're undertaking validation. I think the crucial thing to you know be aware of is really to try and be as systematic as possible. Now, I mean, I'll put my hands up right off the bat that I, I only rarely use JOSM for validation. I tend to rely a lot on ID. Um, which I also realize probably means I do a lot more footwork and have to do a lot more manual um, aspects to that when I carry out validation. But it forces me to probably be very, very pedantic about it and really touch an awful lot of things to try and accomplish it. There's, there's a lot of automated tools, and certainly some of the others might chime in um, who might use some of the automated tools for validation. But really, the crucial aspect for me is is, is being very systematic about it. And so um, it, it's a matter of looking at what the specific instructions are and really prioritizing what we're looking at. So, you know, for the current tasks that's for, that we're working on um, in this particular exercise, obviously buildings are, are one of the crucial things. But certainly when, when I go to do validation, I'll, I'll, pop to, I'll pop to my ID screen just to kind of talk to it a little bit um, here, only because there, I, I happened to choose a random one this morning from the Nuri task to start to go through it. Obviously, when you're going to do validation, you can choose your editor just like you would anything right out of the out of the management application, your, your dashboard, and choose either ID editor or JOSM from that standpoint. I'm using ID here, well, for a variety of reasons. One, I'm on a Mac and this tends to be what we do. Um, it's there's there's a few little extra things involved in JOSM the Macs that sometimes kind of make it funny. It works, but it doesn't always work as well for me. Um, so that's why I'm looking at ID, which makes it simple. One of the crucial first aspects that uh, I do when I'm looking at it is pull up the issue screen that uh, ID Editor gives you down the side. And it gives you an opportunity to choose what it is, what sort of issues you want to look at. I've got them all enabled at this point in time. It's not pulling up any issues on this particular task. Um, and I'm going to make it go away there for a sec. But if I, if I look at this particular task, I would address the issues at the outset. The next thing I'm really looking at is taking a look at the specific elements that are indicated in the instruction. And since we're fo fo um, focusing on buildings from this standpoint, I'm looking to see which of those buildings have really been accomplished. And right off the bat, it was handy that I was able to note that there's missing buildings from this. Now, there's not that many missing buildings. Um, there's three, four, five, six ones that I can see in the top corner there right off the bat. Um, and those are things that, frankly, I would probably add at this point in time. Um, there's, there's a lot of discussion about how much um, fixing goes on versus how much, or how much you would actually do before you invalidate something and send it back for somebody else to, A, learn from the process and do it themselves. I tend to do a fair bit of fixing. I'm in there and I tend to do it. The crucial thing when doing the fixing is to actually make sure that you note that you have undertaken the fixing from that standpoint. So I would I would add those those particular buildings. The other thing that you're really looking at, you know, here if you're somebody that hasn't been doing any validating from that standpoint, is really starting to look at some of the alignment um, and 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 see how well obviously these particular um, buildings have been traced. And they're not bad. Um, I can look at a few and realize right off the bat when you zoom in that. You know, there's there's a fair bit of tracing of of roofs rather than the buildings themselves that have gone under here, and I'd probably start to shift those. I'm also looking to try and see whether things obviously haven't been squared either, 
And this would obviously be a very suspect building at the very top. So I'd want to go in and take a look. Now, as it turns out, when you start to look at it, there is an indication that it's a bit of an irregularly shaped building anyway. Um, and so it may not be that, but I end up uh, touching a lot of the buildings themselves. One, to make sure that, you know, they're, they're, they're squared, but also to make sure that we've got the appropriate uh, tags applied to that. So, I mean, that's the other side of it. So when I start to go in here and we're not doing too bad here, things are actually done right as house as opposed to just building equals yes. So we're, you know, fairly good from that standpoint. The other aspect, obviously, that we have to go into with this is adjusting between the various different imagery um, and to really see both in terms of um, accuracy of the buildings, but also in terms of the age of the imagery. And I know that's been talked about in some of the other issues. So that would be another part of the validation process to make sure you're, you're flipping back and forth between some of that imagery to go through and make sure that the most up-to-date stuff has been, been caught. Tagging all around, both in terms of ways and in terms of, of buildings, is going to be fairly important here. And so you want to make sure not only is it accurate by what your, um, by your understanding of it is, and again, this is only going to come back to your experience, but the other aspect is, is to really ensure that there's a degree of consistency as well from that standpoint. Some of the issues that might get raised in the issue monitor are degrees of overlap, and those are going to come up, as well as some of the ways, specifically the ways of the ways, are mapped here. Um, although they're not part of this particular task, I'd be touching a lot of ways in this exercise to try and make sure that things are uh, aligned properly, but also labeled properly and consistently again, because I know certainly in doing a lot of validation and some of the other uh, county tasks that we've been doing so far, you've got a lot of different people bringing a lot of different experience to this and a lot of subjective judgment on this. So. It's a matter of going back and certainly using your own judgment to try and, and work these through. So that would be kind of my general, you know, introduction to how one approaches it. It's got to be systematic. It's got to go through and, and look at the specific things relating to the task at hand, but also looking for some other little oddities that, that might appear from that standpoint. And then very carefully making sure that when you go back and I'll pop back to my window there for a wee second. When you go back and, and actually mark this either valid or invalid, that you're making good, solid comments that help people to learn um, why you have made the judgment that you have. And whether you're, do, you're invalidating or whether you're marking it valid and indicating what you did, it's a matter of giving an opportunity for people to try and learn from that or also potentially to, to uh, start that discussion around why you know, certain judgments have been made. So I guess that would be, you know, the main introduction to, you know, kind of talking about how I approach the validation process. Over time, has your methods of validation kind of just developed from experience or is there some kind of, of handed down knowledge which, which you learn from other mappers? I think it's, I, I, I think it's uh, you know, I mean, obviously experience changes it. And even, you know, when we were having the eight o'clock discussion on Monday night and that, and we got into the little uh, um, asking the question about how, how are we dealing with, uh, say, semi-detached versus, uh, you know, using uh, house, house yeah. uh, two houses attached versus a semi-detached sort of thing. That's where we're getting an opportunity to learn. So it is really bringing even the telegram conversation into this to get that. But it's been relying a lot on the nature of, of the comments that have been left by others on my own mapping, that's for sure. There are other methods to validate, such as tools that can search for mistakes or for um, errors in the mapping. Are you thinking in terms of automated ways of approaching the, the tap? Yes, there are automated tests, but they weren't I use in conjunction with the hot I'm overlay. Well, absolutely. No, I mean, I think I think the automated approach is is really what we need to be, you know, falling back to. I, I, I feel very, you know, <clears> conscious <throat> that what I how I'm approaching this is is a very manual way of doing things and probably, you know, the longer and, and obviously less automated way of approaching it. I think the opportunity in, say, Jossum and so forth to really analyze the nature of the of the uh, the the mapping that you're working with there and being able to use automated ways of determining exactly how well defined the buildings have been, um, the nature of ways looking for disconnections and so forth. I think those are that that is very much 
the other way of doing it and probably the very, very more powerful way of doing it. Um, this really comes back to the nature of the tools that you tend to employ, you know, from, from the standpoint. But I think, you know, as Kieran's kicking in there sort of thing, very much it's the nature of, you know, the human look at it and, and using and humans using the tool to try and accomplish this because really what you're looking at is just the effect of two humans very much um, that are really bringing two different, hopefully different perspectives to it. And I think quite determinedly different perspectives to it. Um, you know, when we're looking at some of the validation within the particular tasks that, that we're playing with here, you know, there's a danger that should be too close to the, uh, to the, to the process from this standpoint as well. I think there's a lot of really good teams kicking up here that work on these various different ones. But what we're trying to do is make sure that you do bring, you know, the different perspectives to bear on, on taking a look at this. So I think there's, there's the human perspective and then there is obviously the tool-based perspective. And I think some of the bigger, you know, database tool perspective is, is taking obviously a far more unbiased approach to it. Whether it brings in the level of expertise that we're working on, I think is, is part of the bigger question. So I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a question of even when we, you know, open this up to more of a round table and ask some other folks how they approach it. I think that's, a, that's I think there's, there's obviously a lot of ways that people, you know, come at this. Because on that, I was talking to one of the students from the SOCIO. She, and so I had been up in, I'm an embassy of SOCIO. And for me to read the landscape was completely new to me because I didn't have a cultural context for what I was looking at. And the same thing when uh, one of the students from uh, there had been, had been up in here and she saw a building in a field that she presumed was a farmland or was like a, a shed or something because because over there people will live in a village and people don't live in a house in the middle of a field somewhere whereas here we would know that absolutely no i mean i think that you know it's it's, it's a really important point there because we're doing so much you know away here from the standpoint and certainly you know the original open aspect of open street map was very much that you were going to map your locality and you were going to bring your local knowledge to that so I think what you're raising more is the opportunity to have more of this teamwork approach of potentially somebody mapping from away, but also somebody mapping that has that local context, not just in terms of, you know, the built context of the land, but also, you know, the general layout. I know I was mapping, you know, the area that I grew up around only in the last couple of weeks, just for the heck of it, I popped over, you know, was working on something in Canada. And there was a local mapper that came on and said, I'm not sure if you really understand, you know, what it is you're mapping here. I can see you're coming at this from I and I said, geez, I was, you know, I was a, I, 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 I lived there, for, you know, for 15 years and so forth as a small child and ran around a lot. I really know the lay of the land. It obviously changed and so forth, but uh, you were bringing that context to it. And I think you don't, you can't escape that context. Absolutely. So you're probably calling more for this being open to working, you know, and this teamwork approach which is the whole idea behind, you know, OpenStreetMap from that standpoint, that we bring those many eyes to bear on it and we contribute each of us what we can and, and remain open to learning all the time. I think it's crucial, you know, I mean, it was, it, it's been emphasized, you know, I know in some of the other talks as well, very much that we want to keep this as fun as possible too, you know, and I think that's the nature of giving the appropriate feedback, making it a learning process and really making sure that when you are commenting on things and so forth, that you give those um, comments with the degree of respect um, that they demand for people that are actually making a good, honest effort to try and do something. Um, and it becomes something that, that, that helps us build and you build that wealth of knowledge about it. So, I mean, so I think the Lesotan, you know, exercises is very important to understand the nature of how you see those various different shapes. And even if I look at that Nuri task that I pulled up there and so forth, that could be simple eyesight and so forth, the three or five missing, you know, buildings at the top of the tile and so forth look differently. And I know on long series of, of, of mapping exercises, when I'm doing anything, suddenly your mind, your, your eyes and mind just flips and so forth. And you start to, to, to get this, idea. You're, you're getting this funny little approach to, uh, to, to, to parts of the building that disappear or become actually the opposite of what you're trying to see. So I think you have to have to guard a lot of that at times, but that's what many eyes are for. That's for sure. Yeah. Because I find that, that like shadows are very important because I can see the, the back of a building 
and has maybe has a has a concrete carpaccio beyond it. But if you look at, at mm-hmm. it a certain way, it could appear that the that the wall extends to where the patio is. And also, if you have uh, some houses that are near trees, and you have, and you have shadow folding um, on the house, kind of you have very subtle mm-hmm. differences between shades of dark mm-hmm. that you could kind of go, okay, here is the line of a house, but like the difference in the in the in the colors can be very small. Absolutely no. I mean, I think. I think the other thing you're really pointing to is the importance of flipping back and forth between various, you know, the imagery that's available. Um, and I think, you know, that's that's the crucial part that with any of the stuff that we're working on here, you've got to be using multiple imagery and hopefully, you know, realizing that some of the imagery can be misaligned and, and know how to, you know, go, go through the alignment process to try and do it, but certainly to be able to catch the shadows. And I mean, that just comes with experience that you're understanding what those shadows represent you know, and being able to gain an understanding of the mass of the of the building based on the shadows that you're that you're running into there, um, but that's experience and a learned one. You know, I mean, I think I think you should be doing some more validation now, Tad. I think you're probably at a stage where you want to jump into this, but you know, develop your own way of of approaching it. The whole thing of mapping to not just the roof, but where the building sits on the on the land is, is a subtle distinction that. I didn't fully get until this week's series of talks. Mm. And one thing I had been doing was if I have, say, a terrace and I have been aligning um, the each of the houses to a back wall or to a front wall, mm-hmm. because, that, because that's a thin line that's easier to use as, as, an, as an anchor point. And just and before, I wouldn't have been comfortable shifting the building to be off the roof slightly. Yeah, that only comes with experience because, I mean, what you're doing is creating a mental image, you know, in three dimensions of what you're seeing in two dimensions there. So, I mean, that that's that's a that's a process that you're going undergoing in your mind that allows you to attempt to see those things. But you're really putting into the larger context of how humans demark their space there as well. So, I mean, you realize that there's so many other clues around the building as well that can give you clues about the building itself. You know, and especially in terms of, you know, when you're working at terrace housing and so forth, that you realize that people do mark out their own areas and using some of those foot walls and so forth as, as a means of judging where the interior separation might be between those various different terraces, I think is, is, is a crucial one. And you just add that to your kit bag. But, you know, as part of, you know, a, a subconscious process, you're starting to assemble, you know, that 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 3D realization in your own mind of what it is you're seeing based on the shadows, based on the foot walls, based on the surrounding landscape that allows you to see the built aspect. But at the same time, the built aspect is also helping you understand the nature of the natural landscape there as well. So when we're doing the other aspects, and I mean, and and I think you were, you know, very right in bringing it up that we're focusing on a specific task, but it's part of a larger mapping exercise. And so there's an opportunity to go along and do a few extra things when you're do, when you're, when we're working in there specifically because when you're mapping the building, you're getting a better sense of the surrounding landscape, just as the surrounding landscape is helping you understand the buildings more. You know, anyone that's seen my mapping, I tend to put on a lot of driveways. I'm using driveways largely as checkboxes, frankly. It lets me know I've been to that building and I've looked at it, and I've added a particular feature and so forth that I can then see that I've accomplished, I've been down, whether I've uh, gone through the validation process and, and out of the driveway or whether I've actually done the mapping process and out of the driveway. It's it's something that you use to do that. And it adds to that other part of the landscape. So it's all part of that evolving tapestry that you're creating. Absolutely. So has anybody um, in the chat got some questions? You can um, have them written out there or you can turn on the microphone and ask them to us directly. Or if anybody has some ideas about, you know, their own approaches to validation as well. Because, I mean, like I say, I think it's a very personal thing. And I think everybody comes at it in a different way. So if you want to kind of add to the larger one. So the BC says, Sean, contrast your approach with hot. I'm not sure what that means. I think there's more coming, I'm hoping, to something. Oh, there is. Oh, yeah, okay. Keep elaborating here on there. Yeah, the map where people approach from that standpoint. So um, hot is a master versus pupil approach 
the validator is a master and the validated is less experienced. Yeah. So I mean, I, I mean, that's that's the one that I've obviously I've grown up here, sort of thing, being very very much more familiar with. And I I think you know it's largely true. It's a matter where you draw that line between the master and 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 the apprentice in terms of the person being less experienced. I think when we were talking about this, we realized that there's a very, very, you know, low line in terms of the automated locking people out of the validation process here, virtually non-existent, uh, frankly. But the whole idea that, I mean, you learn through the validation process that as you become the master, you become certainly much more active as the validator, that you're the one that actually, you know, undertakes more validation practice than um, actual mapping practice so that you can actually use that as a learning instrument. And certainly that's that's generally, I think, how I've seen more of the validation, um, certainly up until this point in time, that, you know, the master, the experienced mapper and so forth assumes the validation task as much to guide some of the junior uh, learning uh, learners in, in the mapping process and look at the nature of people being able to do, being able to go in and, and as part of mapathons and various different outreach activities being brought on board and undertaking the mapping and then being guided through the nature of the validation practice so that the validation is well documented and attempts to steer people in the appropriate direction. It came back to the nature of how much fixing and so forth actually goes on under there. But what it really underlines is the importance of that documentation process that you take the time to actually indicate what did you see there and gently guide learners to say, okay, were you, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, buildings were not squared, for example, are you aware there's a shortcut and that you can undertake when you go and actually map a building to quickly be able to go in and square those. And frankly, a lot of people miss that and, and gain it over time. So it is I hopefully the nature of that, you know, that guiding process as a learning, um, as a learning process. But do you see saying, aren't there other paradigms than experience versus novice? Like the local versus remote. So I think we brought that up a little bit in terms of the, the this idea of the teamwork. So the one paradigm being certainly the master and the learner, the master and the apprentice, the fact that we actually use validation as a means of, of taking people through the process and helping them build up their understanding of how they should be mapping. The second being, you know, the, the what what uh, what Kieran's raising there is local versus remote mappers that we're taking advantage of the people that are actually on the ground, have the greater context and so forth. So I can use satellite imagery very effectively and attempt to subjectively discern what it is I see and carry out the mapping process, the validator can go through and actually check it based on what they see on the ground and attempt to guide me and go back and forth and gradually increase the, you know, the wider body of experience around that. Now he's adding the increase, the added little bit of being hyper-local. So if I'm actually mapping somebody's house, they know a heck of a lot about that particular house and be, be able to actually um, blend into that particular process. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we like to use the term hyper-local more and more all this time, all, all this time. So we're really talking about people that actually exist in the place that's being specifically mapped, right on the street or in the house that's being mapped, versus somebody that lives within the larger locale, region, country, um, and understands the nature of, say, the built and the, and the natural environment, versus somebody that's relying entirely on imagery. Um, imagery is great, and I mean, the more experience can help you to interpret that imagery, but I think the process really works when we've got this wide involvement of people right from the hyper-local, people that are actually living in the place that you're mapping, to people that understand the nature of the wider region in which you're mapping, to people that understand how to very effectively work with satellite imagery. So there's there are obviously very different paradigms to look at from that standpoint. I think it is all part of the larger open street map experience, but the nature of tasking managers and the way in which we go through these certainly changes that attempts to you know systematize the way in which we approach those we want to get heike's one in there i noticed yeah. he yeah he, he was had kind of a how about you all of the satellite imagery sources yes so of course yes absolutely you have to use all of them all the time no i <laughs> i wish i think you know i think you again it's going to come with experience from that standpoint and and i think it's the most important aspect of that for me is is really looking at um, the provenance of those particular uh, of that particular imagery that you're working with there and understanding what is more up to date, what's less up to date, what was done in a particular season, um, the way the quality of the particular imagery and so forth. 
personally, um, whether I'm doing it right or wrong, you know, personally willing to put it out there from that standpoint, with most of the, the validation that I'm doing here, I'm, I'm probably using only one or two, or using at least two sources of imagery. I'm not going too far beyond that. Most obviously bend off um, other, there's a lot of overlap in, in the imagery we have available. But I think you really have to get an idea of judging the imagery based on the provenance of that imagery. So how recent is it and how, how effective it is in terms of being able to give us the, 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 the best view of it. Realizing that some of the imagery that might might have not be offset correctly or actually be georectified appropriately can give you clear um, uh, view of that. It's some it's often worth the time to go through the rectification process or to take some and and you do run into this an awful lot. And I mean, and this I think is probably one of the bigger conundrums. And I'm happy to throw this open for the wider uh, discussion as well. When you come to you know a tile or something that's been mapped quite extensively using imagery that wasn't offset properly. And so trying to do a mass um, re-offset of imagery that was using um, imagery that hadn't been corrected at that point in time, it's something you know we run into quite, quite often, especially amongst less experienced mappers in a lot of the mapathons that have gone on here. Yeah, because with Bing, they realigned their imagery a few years ago and the work in a social all got shifted a little bit um, um, from where it was. And then if you compare Bing to Maxar, say, you could have a good few beaters, uh, depending on the big imagery, where you have the same building, but it's not exactly in the same place. The rule of thumb that I've been by is that Bing has the best rectified imagery and just to kind of and use that uh, mostly for the placement. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm sure there's more sophisticated ways to try and, and determine how to align something. There absolutely is. And I mean, I think we get into a bigger discussion around the nature of the alignment. I think from, you know, from the nature of the validation process, they're attempting to correct a lot of this. I think it's, it's a matter of having a known good um, rectification that you can then um, use as the corrective so that you can actually either shift the imagery to match the known good uh, mapped uh, features, or in the case of some of the instances where you run into situations where somebody's mapped using uh, incorrectly offset imagery, where you have some uh, spots that are actually mapped correctly, then you can do a mass shift from that standpoint over a particular area. But I know one of the things that came up in 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 the Monday discussion was was again our discussion around the nature of of uh, breaking up the tiles and constantly you know making smaller and smaller tiles. I think, you know, it's a very useful thing, you know, from the standpoint, even during the validation process that, you know, we're working with fairly small and easily uh, manageable um, areas so that they can be effectively done intensively so we can make sure that we catch the, the bulk of the, of the material and the, and the potential issues that we're running into there. So, and do we have a new uh, question from Karen again, Skatoma. I'm not sure if that is a reference to a particular mapper name or a thing. I don't know. Tell us, Kieran. What is that? <laughs> a mapper repetitively mapped 21 buildings in a row as building equals house, but includes the last building, which is not a house. I think yeah. that is a great way to catch that scatoma tendency of humans. So this is our great vocabulary building exercise of the day. So we all now know what scatoma means. Yes. That's very good. But yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, the role of validation from that standpoint, I think is very strong. And that's where we're really going to get into, um, you know, more of the hyper local from that standpoint. Obviously, um, it's tougher for somebody using a lot of the imagery to really take that that step and, and, and start to know it. But I think, you know, scotoma, as we now know, is something we do have to fight from that standpoint, that there is that tendency to keep doing it. I mean, that's a tendency in any any even a bureaucracy and so forth, that there's institutional momentum and it happens even within an individual that, you know, you're starting to see it in the way you want to see it because you've got, you know, your, your rigorous process, your, your, the process that you're going through there. And, and we're working down to actually start to do that. And it can force you to miss those little bits and pieces. So I think it's something you fight and that's why we need other eyes on it. So it really just, you know, reemphasis is that why we have to have validation and why it is an important thing to, to be undertaking there. 
it's absolutely crucial. I mean, we're talking about trying to create, you know, the highest quality map that we possibly can. Um, that's what OSM is all about. And so, I mean, the validation process and bringing as many eyes to bear on this is absolutely crucial. We're constructing different processes, one of which is validation, the rigorous validation process that attempts to ensure that degree of quality and bring the many eyes on it. Hopefully, you know, through various other different processes, whether they're mapathons, whether they're, you know, the fact that we, you know, try and, and come up with different ways of gamifying the system to get as many people playing with it, we bring those many eyes to do it. But I mean, many eyes is obviously one of the things that can try and, and help us break our bad training from the standpoint and not become sc scotomatastic. Having more people involved prevents what Karen mentioned um, earlier in having an elitist group who do the ma who do the validation and then mm. it becomes like a a clique in a way which is always which is which is, a, is another bad thing that we need to avoid as well yeah absolutely i mean i i mean this is that, that's the challenge of any little you know organization from this standpoint um you know that we you know we run into i mean you're feeling that you're not qualified to go out and do the validation and so forth and i mean you're self-censoring as much from that standpoint but I mean, you're perceiving that there's, you know, people out there that have this tremendous knowledge. And I think everybody, you know, has that sense that they're not capable of doing this. But I mean, it comes with experience. It comes with doing it comes with getting the appropriate feedback, you know, to really understand what it takes to undertake it. Potentially, there's a little bit of a plan that you can start with, but you only learn it by doing and you only learn it by by getting through that. But we do need to keep it as as, as diverse as possible. Diversity is what really aids this. Absolutely. Great. And uh, since that comment is, is a bit of shade being thrown at somebody else, I think well, it's, a good, it's a good place to leave this conversation.